Hey, I'm Isabel Burka, and when I was 12 years old, I founded a multi-million dollar bath and body products company called Da Bomb Bath. After five years of building my own brand, I've discovered a passion for helping young and innovative entrepreneurs tell their stories. Hopefully, you'll be inspired by the guests here on build a and maybe even motivated to start a business of your own. Let's get into it. This is build a with Isabel Burkhoff. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the very first episode ever of build a My name is Isabel Burkhoff, and today I have joining me Miss Maxine Clark. You probably know who she is, and she probably doesn't need an introduction, but for the sake of posterity, I am pleased to introduce the founder and the former CEO of build Workshop. Miss Clark, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So I would love to pick up uh, where your whole career and business sort of started. I know that you have a degree in journalism and marketing and um, you wanted to be an attorney, uh, but I would also kind of like to hear how that translates into how you decided to start a business. So I uh, went to law school in Washington, D.C., and I had to get a job to pay for law school. So I got a job at the Heck Company in Washington, D.C., which was like uh, Dayton's or Dayton Hudson or a big company like that, just local in Washington, D.C. And I joined the executive training program and uh, I was going to school at night and in the late afternoon and everything was going great. And then my boss, unfortunately, um, got sick and had a heart attack. And in those days, when you had a heart attack, you were out for like six months. So they asked me, they did not know. He knew I was going to law school, but the bosses didn't know. He asked me, they came to me and asked me if I could fill in for him. Could I travel? Could I go to Europe? Could I do that? It sounded like a lot of fun to me, but I had no idea what I was doing. So I absolutely said yes. And I took a leave of absence from law school, which I'm still on today um, because I found the job so exciting and so much fun. And I learned something um, every single day, every single minute of every day. And I was successful because um, all of the people that were the vendors and suppliers, they wanted him to come back to a successful business and make his bonus. And so um, they helped me be successful. And in the process, I learned more than I would have ever learned just working for him side by side um, because I had to do so many things I would normally, he would have done. Uh, so it was a great experience. And when that was over, um, uh, everybody wanted to know, how did I do it? I was just a kid out of college. How did I do it? And I did it by asking a lot of questions. I think it's good to be, I'm, I'm a curious person anyway, um, but I always liked asking questions and I loved listening to people tell me how they did things and I would record it in my brain and keep going. And um, pretty soon after that, I got promoted to move to St. Louis to work in the corporate office of the May department stores, working for the CEO. And I acted basically like a chief of staff, working on a lot of merchandising and marketing challenges that we had. He was the new CEO, and he wanted me to do just what I did, use my curiosity, uh, dig in and find out what was wrong and fix it. And I did that. And I kept moving up the company to eventually be the president of Payless Shoe Source, which was the largest division of the May company at the time. And uh, I was the president for four years in charge of all the merchandising and marketing. And then um, when the May Company decided to spin it off as a separate public company, I had the opportunity to kind of take my money and run or stay. And I decided to take my money and run and I left to start my own business. I didn't know what it would be, but I knew it would be something fun and something for kids and something that involved the mall because I love to go to the mall um, even when I was a little kid. And I knew that kids like to do it. And how could I bring something different to the, to the mall that they would never experience before? And one day when I was out shopping for Beanie Babies with my next door neighbor, Katie, who was 10 years old at the time, when we couldn't find the Beanie Baby that she wanted, she declared that we, it was so easy we could make them. Well, she meant go home and do a craft project, but I heard something different. And the idea for Build-A-Bear Workshop was born that very day. And about nine months later, we opened our first store in St. Louis, Missouri. Nine months later. Yes. So you could have a baby in nine months. That's sort of like your business baby that you created. That's exactly right. That's so crazy. And honestly, looking back at your story and, you know, even thinking about people who don't necessarily want to start a business but want to advance in their careers can take what you just told us and apply that to what they want to do in their jobs. Because not only were you successful, you know, at starting your business, obviously, as we'll find out um, more about into the interview with Build-A-Bear, but, um, you know, you were also successful in your career. And that's that's really impressive, and I think the audience can take that um, away from this. 
Yes. Being entrepreneurial is an important, you know, a criteria for being successful because it means that you're willing to try new things, to take risks, to think outside the box. And those are all qualities that businesses do want. And if you go to work in a company that doesn't want you to do that, and that's the kind of person you are, you shouldn't go work there. And in doing that, I feel like you, you really proved that the best way to Apl- really apply yourself to something is to get that experience. Um, and even you, you implemented that into starting your business by creating this, you know, retail experience, unlike anything else that anyone had ever seen uh, before, which is really cool. Yeah, I think the the one part about that, that's true is so true is that I wanted when I was a little kid, my most fun thing, like a lot of kids is to go on experiences to go on a field trip. And I thought that when I was thinking about Build-A-Bear, I thought about creating field trips that kids could go on all the time. Technology was just coming into being, but I knew that kids wanted to do touchy feely things and that when they do, they have this big wow look on their face. Like it's so exciting. Um, and it's like, you know, we know that everybody likes to do do it yourself kinds of things. So how, how could we make it sort of do it yourself? Um, and still be something, a really popular product and nobody could make a mistake. That would be the ultimate idea. And that's really what we came up with. Yeah, for sure. I've definitely seen that in my own, you know, line of work too with my Bath and Body Products company. Uh, I actually wrote two books, uh, Bath and Beauty books, uh, Good Clean Beauty and Fizz Boom Bath, um, which are DIY Bath and Body Products books. And people just, you know, loved doing the recipes themselves. I think Build-A-Bear was also really ahead of its time in the sense that, you know, uh, people these days are really investing more and more in the experience as opposed to only just the item. And when you go to Build-A-Bear, you know, you get a memory and you also get a super cute fuzzy bear. I still remember my Build-A-Bear experience. I actually went through my friend's birthday party and my mom came with me and we both put the heart and the bear together and it was super, super meaningful. And I still have my bear. Her name is Rose. And um, she's just like one of my you know favorite childhood memories and toys as well. I'll give Rose a hug for me. I will. Thank you so much for providing that memory for me. You're welcome. So uh, I've heard you a couple of times mention a couple of like buzzwords like in those days um, and, you know, kind of talk about uh, the up and coming technology of the era. And I'd really love to ask you about a couple different things, um, how they've changed over time. One, how uh, just business and retail in general has changed over time. And then also uh, your experience, uh, how your experience in being a woman in business has changed over time? Well, there have been lots of changes in business. I wish there was as many changes as being a woman in business, but it's changing rapidly now because of the way business is done. So the best part about business today is that you can start a business um, pretty easily. Uh, you have uh, can go online and do a direct-to-consumer business, and you can hook up into Shopify, and they have a million apps that you can use that make your business even bigger and broader. And you can advertise on Instagram or on Facebook or on TikTok, and you have instant customers. And I am a pr- proof positive that that works because I buy so much stuff online and I often buy it just right out of an ad that I saw on Instagram or on Facebook or on TikTok. And um, I get some great products that I would have never seen in a store. So now you don't have to have a store. You can make your store your closet or your bedroom or your studio or your office. And you, you know, once you decided you're making your products like you are, you have to create a factory environment that you can make the products in and produce them and ship them to your customers. But I have many young entrepreneurs that I mentor that basically one of them started a handbag business about last year, this year. And she went to Senegal and she saw a factory that was making these beautiful handbags and she designed them and had them make her a couple 50. And she went online and made an ad for them and sold them out in 24 hours. And she immediately had a handbag business. That's a, that's remarkable. And I think that's a great way that women, uh, young women and older women are starting businesses today, men too. But I think we know that there's a lot of neat products out there that people would like, like a, a bath bomb or a teddy bear or a pan bag or a necklace. And we don't necessarily want to buy the stuff that's in Macy's or in any department store. We want something different and unique and we're looking for it. And when we find it, we press click and buy it. And I think that's the exciting part about how easy it is to start a business. How to scale a business is much harder. Scaling your business to make it to sell millions. And I know you sell your product in other people's stores. So you have to make a lot to fill up their store shelves. That's a different story. That's much more complicated. For women, I think that once you get your feet wet in the business and you open up that first store on TikTok or that first on Instagram, 
you know, and you see how successful it is, it gets you and you start going. And that is a big fuel. But as you have to know what you don't know. I think that's one of my key um, strengths is I know what I don't know. And there's still a lot of things I don't know, and I'm willing to learn them. And I think that's a woman's strength. Women are, we know we don't know everything. And, you know, they say that when men apply for a job, they only have to have 50% of the uh, qualities in that job description to take it, but women think they have to have 110%. We, we just want to be the best. And sometimes we overdo it. Um, and I don't think you have to be the best. I think you have to be, re- get into gear. I say ready, aim, fire, or ready, fire, aim is my motto, mo- more my motto than ready, aim, fire. Um, I'm ready, get in it and learn from your mistakes and tweak it and keep going. And that is something that I think can um, uh, really be an effective tool. I do think that women also generally, um, if you're married and have kids and responsibilities, it's hard to come home at night from a job and do your business your, your, your side gig. So you have to decide when you really want to make it your full-time hustle. Uh, that's a big difference. I think that's a, uh, that point when you make that decision to do this full-time is a really big deal. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's easier than others, but for the most part, that's a big decision to hire people, to pay other people, to now be responsible for other human beings in your company, um, that aren't your family, that it's a big deal. And I, and it's not to be taken lightly, but I think we can also overthink it. Absolutely. And I remember when my business was still in my basement and, you know, we were making all the bath bombs by hand, just my family and I, uh, it, it was really a lot of hard work, but then all of a sudden we had employees and that kind of put the pressure on us because before it was just us making bath bombs, we had ourselves to rely on, but all of a sudden other people were relying on us as well. And that made it very real. Welcome back from the music break, everybody. If you're just tuning in now, you are listening to the very first episode ever of build a biz on Build-A-Bear Radio, and I am actually here with the queen of Build-A-Bear herself, Miss Maxine Clark, the founder and former CEO of Build-A-Bear Workshop, and we were just now talking about how being a woman in business has changed since 1997 when Build-A-Bear Workshop was founded, as well as some qualities that we believe make women really great entrepreneurs. And one of those qualities I would just like to jump into right away is the fact that us women, we are the target market. You know, when I was starting my bath bomb business, I used bath bombs all the time. When you, Miss Clark, went shopping with your neighbor and she said that she would enjoy making a a stuffed animal, you had a really great idea to bring her idea to life. And that's not to say that, you know, men aren't the target market because obviously there are different markets for uh, different products. But I think that for a long time, men were deciding what women wanted, where now there's a lot more women deciding what women need. And I think that's been really pivotal in the last couple of years or so. I think that's so true. It's absolutely true. Because I, when I started out in the retail business, women were just coming to the workforce and we needed new clothes, new accessories, new things. And that was one of the reasons that made me successful in those early days. And I think we're at another pivot point right now because there's so many young African-Americans and Hispanic young people who are starting their own businesses and they are hugely successful because they know who their customer is too. They are their customer and they want a slightly different style, a slightly brighter color, a different shape. They know what they want and they're creating products and services and it's going to be great for the economy and great for them as entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And I just, I'd like to compliment you because I've noticed that with like your signature red lip and you know, your, your fun, bright colored outfits you don't sacrifice one ounce of femininity as you're you know going about your career and i think that that's really cool yeah it's you're right no it's it's so true and the um you know the other part is we can buy things and now there's stores like like ulta or sephora where you can go in and buy such a myriad of products where before you were in a department store it was behind the counter and you had to ask somebody to help you and they told you what looked nice on you you didn't know yourself but now you can, it's all self service it's diy and you can figure it out yourself and they give you lots and lots of tools and uh trial and error but um, and you can buy something for six ninety nine or something for sixty dollars and nine cents. Uh, you know, there's just lots of variety that you can choose from, and we know what we want, so we get to pick. Yes, and you know, I actually see that mentality in that you put into building build a bear. You know, you you get to build your own bear. You get to make your own stuffed animal any way that you want to make it. 
it is cool. You get to make it any way you want. I've seen frogs with wedding dresses on them and prom dresses, and I've seen uh, gr- really pink bears and rainbow bears with baseball outfits on. So it doesn't matter. Every one is unique and different. That's the other part about Build a Bear is that there's no two bears that are ever alike because no child puts the exact same things on on any bear. They 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 are all different, and they have a different wish inside of them, which makes them very very unique. Oh, I wish I could remember my wish. I feel like it was probably something like, I hope I get put on the nice list for Christmas this year or something. So going back to something you said earlier in the interview, uh, you said that your biggest strength was that you know what you don't know. And I think that's really cool. Um, And I think a lot of people can probably take that with them. I was wondering if I could ask you, uh, you know, that's your biggest strength. What is your biggest weakness? Hmm. I think my biggest weakness, and maybe some people wouldn't think of this as a weakness, is I see the good in everything. I see opportunity in every single idea, but I can't go and do them. And so, it, you know, some people are equipped to go and take their idea from start to finish. Others aren't, and they're going to need a lot of help. And they may need more, some ideas need more money than others. And I feel like I can see it so clearly. I It just, it, you know, it, the spark goes off. And I wish I could help them, you know, get it to fruition, but you can't do everything. Uh, And everybody has to learn and do things at their own pace. So my idea that what I saw in them may not necessarily be what they see in themselves. Um, And I want to wish that to be true, that they could see how great their idea is and go for it. But I see so many potential ideas because I work with so many young people and young entrepreneurs that are brilliant brilliant, I should say. And they have um, so many thoughts and ideas about what they want to change in the world and they can do it. It's just that sometimes you need a different blend of experience and money uh, than other ideas. And like you could start your idea in your basement and you were experimenting and you know fooling around. You didn't have to buy a warehouse. Others, there's more expensive you know, to start. Uh, but that's my probably my biggest uh, fallback is I, I see potential in everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like that really shows through in you as a person. I know you to be a very benevolent person when it comes to um, helping entrepreneurs, especially other young entrepreneurs and believing in young people. Uh, And I want to ask you, what advice would you give to a young person listening who maybe wants to become an entrepreneur? I would first say that you should write your plan down, no matter how complicated you think it is, you need to write it, put it in writing, because the person you have to convince first that this is a good idea is yourself, because it's going to take a lot of time, and it may not be an idea that you want to start tomorrow, but to get it to where you want it to be, and when you, you know, you you put it on a computer, you can change it at any time you want, but dream the dream supreme. Dream the biggest dream you can be. Don't worry about money when you're dreaming the dream. Just figure out what, what is this idea, and how many... Um, things can I make it to make it wonderful so that customers will buy it or use it or whatever the, the product is. And then work backwards to figure out how do you do it on a Ford budget instead of a, a, a Bentley uh, budget. Um, and then, you know, you could say, this is not something I'm ready to start yet, but I'm going to put it on the back burner and I'm going to do it in a year when I graduate from college or um, I'm going to do it started in the summer when I'm on my summer vacation, whatever it is, but get the, get, write it down so that you sure you want it and then be open to other people's ideas for tweaking it. And then the other is if you're going to want to go in the restaurant business or you want to go in the retail business or you want to go in the cosmetic business, go get a job if you're old enough to work in one of those areas. Not that that's what you're going to do forever, but learn the ins and outs of it. You know, ask a lot of questions. Ask, who, you know, where do they buy that from? How do they get that? How does it get from the factory to here? You know, do all the questions as if you, you know, like you're studying to be an entrepreneur. And you'll learn a lot that way. That's how I learned. It, did, it took me longer than a few years, but I did learn it. And that knowledge was sort of almost like um, born into me by osmosis because I was around smart people that did those things. And I paid attention, not close attention, but enough attention that it kind of did kind of just come inside my brain. And I think being around smart people that know things that you don't know, uh, you can learn much easier. Mm -hmm. And that advice actually goes back to something that you said earlier, which is when you were describing the ready, fire, yeah. aim process. You know, you, you get ready, you make your plan to start your business, you launch your business and you start to make your product or your do your service or whatever it is that you're doing. And then as your business matures, you start to tweak certain aspects of it um, as you start to aim it in the direction that you want it to go based on feedback. You mentioned just some advice that you'd like to give to entrepreneurs. And one of the pieces of advice was uh, to work in the industry that you really want to excel in when you're young. And, uh, you know, you not only mentioned that, you know, uh, to have a plan after maybe you graduate from college, but you also mentioned that 
it's an also an option to have a plan during summer. And I think that that's really important because a lot of people don't really think that they can start their career so young. Um, but I feel like even when I was starting my career over my summer break, uh, you know, starting my bath bomb business, no one really told me that I couldn't. And I feel like it's people like you that are inspiring young people to enter the industry of entrepreneurship, you know, younger and younger every day. And I think that that's really awesome. It is really an important aspect of our economy as well. I would say that one of the things that I think we inspired at Build a Bear when you could come in and make your own bear was a whole generation of makers, people who do, don't want to buy a bear off the shelf anymore. They want to make it and they want to make something else and the next thing and the next thing. And you may not realize it, but that teddy bear that you bought and uh, that you made in our store when you were five or six maybe gave you that inspiration to make something in your basement. That's so true. And when you think about it, it's such a great example as well for children, because in a way you're really teaching them, you know, the process of how businesses function that are creating products and services. Um, because, you know, when you're young, you go to the grocery store and you're like, well, uh, there must be bananas growing in the back of the store because I, I don't know where these come from. But then um, when you have experiences like you do at Build-A-Bear, you, you, you kind of start to put two and two together like, oh, these products actually have to be made. And then in a way, you sort of inspire an entire generation to be entrepreneurial through a fun activity that you invented. And I know you mentioned earlier in the interview that one of the ways that you absorb that information that you did when you were first starting out in your career was almost through osmosis. You know, you were able to absorb the um, the skills around you. And in a way, it's like that younger generation is absorbing those same creative skills through making a Build-A-Bear. And I wanted, you know, sometimes parents would say, oh, no, that doesn't go on that frog. And I'd say, oh, no, let them let them do it. It's just all about their imagination. I want to take a picture of that frog in that dress. And people would then they'd relax a little bit because they didn't think they thought their son should make a, a frog in a baseball outfit, not necessarily in some kind of dressy outfit. But I think that Build-A-Bear did open up the creativity for lots of people, including boys, because I thought we were going to have mostly girls, but we actually have a lot of boy customers because they were the ones that took the sports outfits and put it on bears. They dressed a frog or a dinosaur. They picked the animal that they wanted, but they dressed it in a myriad of different outfits. And I think that's all about using your imagination. And we should all, every business, whether you're a hotel or a grocery store, or a department store, a drugstore, you should welcome children as customers because they will remember everything they saw in your store because they don't have a lot of other things crowding up their brain. I can remember every store. My, I could draw you a picture of the department store in Miami that my mother took me to almost well, at least once a month because I remember every single inch of it because I, was, I had nothing else to crowd my brain back then. And I think kids, that's when they get all these ideas. And I, I encourage young people, I don't care if they're five years old or 15 years old, write it down. It doesn't mean you have to do it today, but remember that you had this idea and put it in a journal and keep it for the future. And you might go back to it and decide, you know what, that's still a really good idea. I'm going to do that. That's so cool. And I love that you included uh, boys in this creative adventure as well, because um, I even saw this when I was starting my business. Uh, we just made a lot of female skewed bath bombs. And one day, my little brother, who was maybe like eight at the time, he said, could you put my Lego inside of your bath bomb? And then I could have a superhero bomb. And we actually still have the hero bomb today. And that was his idea. Um, we put a cool superhero surprise inside. It's not a Lego, but it's really awesome. And he, he, you know, he had that idea. And now we have a whole line of male skewed bath bombs. And people will come to us and say, my son loves your bath bombs. And we couldn't find any other bath bombs out there for young boys. And and I think you bring up a really important point that, you know, kids are very impressionable and they have a lot of great ideas because they don't really think too hard about what other people want. They know what they want. And I feel like that's a really great uh -huh. aspect of entrepreneurship that you need to include is you don't have to think about what other people want. You have to realize what you need or want and then bring that to the market. And then other people will realize that, oh, I also have that problem and I'd love to have it solved. Something else I'd like to quickly touch on, too, is you believed in your young audience. You know, you said you trusted the creative process of these boys who are putting dresses on stuffed animal frogs. And I think that's something that I really admired about you was your ability and your openness to listen to what young kids had to say about what they wanted to see yeah. in the industry. And that's really cool that you support young people like that. Thank you. 
No, I think that, you know, that one thing about being a creative person, and there's many ways to be creative and many ways to impact industries. And in any given day, I can talk to a, an engineer who wants to be a patent lawyer or a, a young woman like yourself who's invented a cosmetic company. And I think that that for me is, is what America is all about, uh, is about opportunity and taking that opportunity. And it doesn't mean you have to create your own business. You can work in somebody else's and help them be really successful. In fact, I did that for 25 years. It was really fun. Um, so it doesn't matter, really. It's just to get out and do what your heart tells you to do. And it's the journey that really is the best part, not the destination. It's all the things you learn along the path to get to where it is you're going. And you might get there at 30, or you might get there at 40, or you might not get there till you're 60. But as long as you're moving along and towards progress and towards learning and growing and traveling and seeing the world, whatever way you want to see it, some people are outdoors people, some people like to travel to fancy art museums, whatever it is, um, there's no right or wrong. It's what your heart leads you to do. And when you do that, something that you're passionate about, you will be, your heart will be full and your bank book will probably be full too. Because if you're doing something you don't like, you won't work as hard at it. You won't be as successful as, as you can be when your heart is full. That really is such amazing advice. And I really hope that every boy, girl, every person, every child, every adult, every uh, senior even is listening to this right now and thinking, you know, I just, I'm going to pursue what I'm passionate about from this moment on. Um, and I think we can all really, really take that away with us. Uh, Miss Clark, thank you so much for coming on my first ever episode of Build a Biz. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have, but I really, really enjoyed speaking with you. If you don't want to miss an episode and you're out and about, definitely do download the iHeartRadio app as well. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day.